Yeah, welcome back to Transformation Time with the Samaritan Strategy. I'm so happy and so excited that we can come together to dialogue on issues of disciple making, discipleship. And that means, as I've said, nurturing, equipping, mentoring, and empowering people to be more and more like Christ. So we talk about discipling nations. And that is so critical in our days. Because for many, Christianity has lost its salt. And Christianity is no more the light of the world. And it's all because people have compromised. And the very people who should be the light are more than darkness. The people who should hold on to the truth are the embodiment of lies. The people who should reflect the beauty of Christ are the sons and daughters of Satan himself. It has come to a time that the church should rise and disciple the nations. Because if the church does not disciple the nations, the nations will disciple the church. When that happens, then our being on earth will be of no use. Then we can be the light of the world. Then the church cannot be the salt of this earth. And that's why we started talking about discipling the nations from the, begin, the beginning of this first half. And we started by saying that it is time for us to disciple nations. It is time for us to learn something from the Reformation. It is time for us to, for Christians and for Christian people to see themselves as gates of the city, gates of their businesses, gates of their professions, gates in governance, gates in family work. And we also saw that it is time for Christians who have been discipled to see themselves as forests in a sea. There is no hopelessness. Even though many people think Africa is hopeless. We are in a dark continent. But there is hope because the children of God are here to rise up above mediocre and, and dishonest behaviors and are now going to stand out as ambassadors and representatives of the Most High God. And from gates, we came to forest of the seed. And from forest of the seed, we spoke about business as a mission whereby every kind of work we do we do it as unto the lord we are so focused so intentional about living out the christian life such that christ can be incarnated in whatever we do he will be represented his intentions will be clearly seen that we are not here as part-time christians facing a full-time satan no, we are confronting Satan in all the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that the Bible says that the gates of hell shall not stand or crush it, because Jesus remained the conqueror. And it is important for us to see what we do as a form of worship. So we did talk about work as worship. And as we talk about work as worship, we see the people who do work. The people are leaders in various domains. And leaders, the greatest asset of Christian work is service. We are here to serve our representatives of the Most High. And then He is our model and our example. That's why even when He is uh, one of the two of his topmost apostles, James and John, requested that they should be made to sit at his right and left. He told them point blank. If you want to be the leader, you have to be a servant. If you want to be great, you have to be the servant of all. In Christ Jesus, what brings about greatness is service. If you want to be great in this world in the kingdom 
It's not about title. It's not about position. It's not about the influence you world. It is about service. Service to man. And when he appears, all of us are going to give account of that. Today, I want us to seriously talk about um, the truth that liberates. The truth that liberates. I'm so happy to have learned that people like Daryl Miller, Bob Morfitt, and Scott Allen, that I can learn from them. Especially Scott, who has a family as his heartbeat, teaching and talking about it all the time. The truth that liberates, recovering a godly vision for marriage and the family. This topic becomes so important. Because there is currently a desperate war by Satan against the family and against marriage in particular. Marriage has been separately and differently been redefined. And people put marriage as anything else. But we know the originator of marriage. And for that matter, family. The God we serve. He is still dead. It. He is the founder. He is the person who had the world at heart to ensure that humanity continued to grow in the likeness, in the beauty, in the goodness of him. And so, as we discuss this topic, those who have not married, I think, should start getting excited about it. Because that's the best thing you can get in this life if you marry and if you have a family. That's the beauty of it. If you do not all may want to marry, God specifically did mention that it's not good for a man to stay without having a partner. So, it's so exciting to talk about this topic. Re recovering a godly vision for marriage and family. The truth that liberates. Marriage, as instituted by God, is sacred. It is God created, God ordained, and God designed. That's why if you try to talk about it differently, and to position it in another domain, it is disaster. Marriage. The sacred. Because it is God created, God ordained, and God designed. It is the first social institution created by God. And the only one created proud to the fore. We cannot remake it without serious consequences. For me, as a sociologist, you see, you cannot talk about society without marriage. You cannot talk about society without marriage. It's a foundation. It's so foundational. Marriage and family, they are so foundational. Without it, we don't have family. We don't have society. And we don't have society what then do we have? What then do we have? Then, you see, we can be in a mess. And that's why it's so critical a topic to be considered. Now, again, I want to repeat. Marriage is sacred. It is God created, God ordained, and God designed. It's the first social institution created by God and the only one created proud to the fall. We cannot remake marriage. You may want to define it your own way. And if you do that, you make it with serious consequence. Adam and Eve, these were the paradigmatic, uh, paradigmatic couple intended to be the model Parting for all marriages, Adam and Eve. God intended that they become the model. Because God created Adam and Eve, male 
and female. Nowhere do we see homosexuality. It's completely excluded. Because Adam and could find no helper suitable for himself among the animals. Bestiality or bestiality is excluded. The best helper suitable for Adam was Eve. So it's not another Adam. Eve was not created for another Eve. Adam was created for Eve. Because God created just one woman for Adam. The pattern of monogamy, as we call it, polygamy or polygyny, is clearly uh, not the case. The pattern God created was one woman for Adam. Now, this is so true. What is God's ultimate purpose in this? When we read Habakkuk 2, verse 14, it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God's knowledge should cover our world. And that's why we do say that if the church does not disciple the nations, the nations will disciple the church. Now the world is giving a redefinition of marriage and the family. The world is talking about something else. Very foreign to scripture. The world is creating some sort of uh, 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 beauty in a certain type of marriages. The social media, media has become the point of reference. And people are shaping their lives, their attitude, their, their, their uh, 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 lifestyle on social media. It is time for us to come out with the truth. The Bible says you know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. While God's strategy, as is told in Habakkuk 2.14, that the F will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. It all starts with the individual. That's the starting point. It starts with you, the individual. That's why you are so important. You are so critical in God's agenda. And that's why he created you in his image and likeness. You are not like any other person. Not comparable. You are, did he never compare you to another person Another human being, or an animal, or a tree, or a stone. No. Don't try to compare yourself to anything. You are too special, unique. If you want to compare, you compare yourself to him. Because he created you in his image and likeness. And God's strategy starts with you, the individual. From you. Then it expands to the family through marriage. That is so important. There are people who don't want to marry as ordained by God, but want a family because they want to adopt. That's interesting. God's agenda starts with you, the individual, and it expands to the family, to the community, and then from the community to the nation, and then. In the nation, we have the other domains, like the arts, like the media, like commerce or business. We see law and governance and other areas of life. So the purpose of the family, according to Genesis 1, 27 to 28, says that so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, the purpose of marriage. Be fruitful. First, God blessed them. 
and say be fruitful and increase. Now that fill the earth. Now that's so important for us to know. You should rule over the fish. Now these words are so interesting when you come to Africa. Fishes rule over us. Mosquitoes sometimes even rule over us. We have no control over, over the powers, the spirit, the gods, the, the, the mammy water and all other powers. No. No control. Over the sky. No control. Over even land. Over mountains. They dominate our lives. A God blessed man. First to be fruitful and increase and to fill the earth and to subdue the world. Why have children? Why have children? Why do we need children? How does society answer? In my society, I mean that is so important. When you grow without marriage, or if you marry without children, now there are lots of perception said about you. And life sometimes becomes miserable if you do not have children. And our children serve as the very, I mean, the very joy of our hearts. They are the satisfaction that some people get in their marriages. And so when you marry, the obvious outcome is to have children. Even though not all are blessed to have children. But it is so important for us, especially in Africa. So children are a blessing to marriages. And the purpose, number one, is that he is seeking godly offering. Seeking godly offering. These commandments that I give you today, uh, to be upon your hearts, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7. In multiplying, we are seeking godly offering. Not people who are born without care. Not children born who cannot be fed or taken care of. The purpose God's word that say go multiply is a command seeking godly offering. People or children who will impress the godliness on their hearts. And the Bible says talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, these commands of God should be implanted in them. Psalm 22 verse 6 says, Train a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he will not turn from it. So it's a command to train children to be people who are godly. People who do not only know God, sing about him, shout about him, but people who are like him. They are trained. Behaviors and conduct are just like him. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So the first purpose for having children is that God, he is seeking godly offering. We should have children who are godly in every way. Here I'm talking to children of God. People who call themselves Christians. We cannot fail in this. Because we are the only people who can bring our children to that level. As our good friend Elizabeth Yeoman said, every child is a promise. A promise with a name, a passion, a story, and a place in his story, God's story. Every child is unique. There are no ordinary children. How do we train our children? How do we even relate to them? How do we nurture and train them? Do we have time? 
And a trade pastors are asked, do we have time for children? Or we leave children in the hands of the Sunday school teachers? Sometimes we don't even have time to visit them. We don't have time. When some children come to church early and sit at the pews, the elderly come late. And what do the church leaders do? They sack them. And then bring out the adult to sit there. Because they don't pay tithes. Those who pay tithes and give money to the church are the adults. So when even children come early and occupy the front seat, that is not their place. How do we treat children? How do we respect them? How do we accord them dignity? Sometimes we claim that they are the future leaders. But what kind of future leaders are we talking about? The future leaders who are going to be like that, like us, who do not have time. We claim to be busy, sometimes busy doing God's work, such that we don't have time for even our children at home. So you have many, many men of God's children being wayward. Some are drug addicts, drunkards, immoral in many ways, which indicates a total failure of parenting. God's instructions for us is to bring out godly children who have godly domain. I mean, when you hear, I mean, from people like Hugo Crotius, 1583, he said, He who knows not how to rule a kingdom that cannot manage a province, nor can he wield a province that cannot order a city, nor he order a city that knows not how to regulate a village, nor he a village that cannot guide his family, not can that man govern well a family that knows not how to govern himself. Now this thought provoking and it, it shows how we are able to even rule ourselves like father, like son, like daughter, like mother. So you see, you see the mess we find ourselves. You see the corruption. You see the arrogance. We see all the, the mess around us. And it, it appears no one is in control. The role of a husband is that it's first and foremost protection. Protection of a wife and children. Alertness to dangers and temptations. The role of a husband is initiative, proactive, set the agenda, takes leadership action in relationship to wife and children. The husband is not passive. The role of a husband is to have vision. Clearly understands the biblical vision for family and teaches it to wife and children. The role of husband is responsibility as head, husband is ultimately accountable to God for his wife and children. How about the wife? The role of a wife is a helper. The man needs the help and the woman needs to help. That's what Douglas Wilson said. The man needs the help and the woman needs to help. The role of a wife, a nurturer of children, thus the nurturer of nations. The Miller has written a beautiful book on that. A nurturer of nations. The wife, educator, the husband as head, is ultimately responsible, but he delegates to his wife the majority of the day-to-day -day teachings, particularly with younger children. The wife is educator. The role of the wife 
is a manager of the household under the leadership or headship of the husband. The wife is vice regent and manager of the home. Proverbs 31, 37, and Titus 2, verse 5. So how does this apply for church leaders? The first thing is to repent. If necessary, repent. And that's so important. Because sometimes we don't take, I mean, action or leadership or marriage to be a very critical topic for discussion. And so we leave it and talk about so-called spiritual things. But this nurturing a nation. And church leaders are to impact this vision. And we have to teach the godly pattern of marriage, of nurturing children, of parenting. Above all, we have to model the godly pattern in our own family and honor the role of the husband or father at the head of the household and empower them to lead. All the supports. We also, we also have to check our progress. Whether we are doing good, whether we are failing, or whether we are not doing our part. And we should focus on key teaching opportunities. We should begin with husband, fathers. And a focus on teaching our youth. Pre-marital counseling is so critical. These topics are so critical if really you want to bring out godly families. We have to join and support local, regional, and national efforts to combat divorce, cohabitation, same-sex marriage, violence against women, and other lies of Satan. We have to join and support it. It is so important because all the ravages the cruelties against women. All the dangers that have been uh, executed to children and to women in particular has to do with the family. And as the family is destroyed, then society cannot live in love. They cannot have their, their peace and sanctity. The works and the role of fathers and mothers are so critical. But they are critical only when their influence is also made on the children. To bring up godly children. Children who fear God. Children who don't just read the Bible and pray. Children who will exhibit Loyalty, honesty, integrity, ethical values, moral values are cherished. Not children who use social media as their models of life. It has come to a time parents have to be so intentional. If in need we want to build a future generation of leaders who are godly, who are compassionate, and who are fruitful and beneficial to society. If not, we just give some um, good uh, meaning to future leaders. And yet, they will just come and repeat the very mistakes of the parents. God in giving us this command, also say he is with us to the end of the age. He supports and he cherishes 
good and and holy matrimony and then also good families and we can't disappoint him we cannot fail we are his representatives that are to nurture and to bring out godly children in godly families and he is our helper thank you so much and god bless you all